In Ohio's capital, a field becomes a graveyard when a woman's body is discovered. But solving the murder would be a challenge. Detectives turn to a difficult and rare technique in hopes of finding her killer. 911 receives a desperate call in Fort Worth, Texas. A man's wife is shot. Forensic investigators search for clues in unlikely places, hoping the victim herself could provide information needed to determine how and why she died. Whether a crime is meticulously planned or carried out in a moment of passion, perpetrators leave behind evidence. With a discerning eye, investigators reveal fatal impressions killers leave behind. This episode, some of the names have been changed. Columbus, the capital of Ohio, is known for its wholesome Midwest values, a growing community where the rate of violent crime is much lower than other cities its size. Yet on November 7, 2001, Richard Middleton made a startling discovery. In a vacant lot, he found the body of a nude female lying in a tangle of overgrown weeds. He immediately called 911. The operator on call dispatched a team of investigators to the site. Columbus police officers and medical technicians arrived at the location, south of downtown Columbus. The victim was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators roped off the area and started gathering evidence. They hoped to piece together the events that left a woman dead. As they processed the crime scene, investigators noted the victim's position. She was lying on her back. Her arm was raised above her head. And her undergarments were pulled down around her ankles. But the most alarming evidence found by the crime techs were ligature marks on the victim's neck. They suspected she was strangled. Investigators gathered a few items of clothing, including a black and white tennis shoe found near the body. Despite all their findings, police uncovered no solid leads. They were a long way from finding the killer. Ronald Jester was the first detective on the scene. Well, we had very little forensic evidence at the scene. There was no weapon, uh, nothing to indicate who she may have been with, where she had been. Found no identification of her. There's no way of, of tracing her to any particular spot or anything. None of the things that you hope you find that will give you a direction to, to begin to look for a suspect. Investigators also spoke to neighbors in the area. Several said they heard screaming earlier, but they thought it was just kids playing in the field. But no one remembered seeing anyone or anything suspicious. Crime techs photographed the area as well as the body. Okay, Bill, you're ready to bag her right hand? They carefully preserved the woman's hands. They hoped material found under her fingernails could provide clues. The body of the victim was then transported to the Franklin County Coroner's Office. There, they took more detailed photos, focusing on several bruised areas. Dr. Brad Lewis, the Franklin County Coroner, performed the autopsy. He noticed the marks on the victim's neck. After analyzing the wounds, Dr. Lewis was able to determine the cause of death. 
She had blunt trauma, which means she had been beaten throughout the body, arms, and legs. She had also been strangled, uh, which was the actual cause of her death. They collected tissue and other material samples found under the victim's fingernails. The forensic team detected heavy bruising that indicated evidence of rape. Using a rape kit, they gathered possible DNA evidence left from her assailant. All evidence was sealed and sent for further analysis. The examiner then took her fingerprints in the hopes of finding out who she was. When police submitted the prints to the Ohio Fingerprint Data Bank, they quickly confirmed her identity. The victim was Tina Baxter, age 29. She had a police record for several minor offenses. Police also learned that she had had many addresses. She had been drifting from place to place and from job to job. At the Columbus Crime Lab, criminalist Amarina Clarkson analyzed the evidence gathered at autopsy. She examined the rape kit findings as well as the victim's clothes. She also analyzed the stains found on the victim's undergarments for traces of blood and DNA. We were able to tell that the swabs had semen present by using a color test that will indicate that there's a possibility of semen being present. After we do that color test, we then use a test that looks for a protein that is only found in high levels in semen. This information confirmed sexual assault and gave investigators DNA information about the assailant. Yet they had no suspect to compare to the samples. His identity remained a mystery.